Hey everybody, I'm Rousseau. I do a little work here and there, and it looks like we're back in the research workshop. This time we are more or less talking about tubes. Yeah, tubes. Or really rolled up pieces of paper. And as sort of first specimens, we are looking at these. Both examples of a fidget slash skill toy. The one on the left, a kururen. And the one on the right, my own adaptation, the rururen. And you can see the big difference here is the curve on the sides. The one on the left does have additional foam pads at the ends, but other than that, their cores are exactly the same. So, really, the challenge here is to figure out how to vary the width of a strip of paper so that when you roll it around itself, it makes whatever curve you were interested in in the first place. So the starting dimensions of one of these are easy enough to find. Really, you just need a picture that isn't too distorted, or you could run some complicated equations, or you could just find the dimensions online and scale them yourself. And I guess I would go with a combination of one and three. Of course, I don't know how well you're going to do if you go the 3D reference route, because at least on Thingiverse, it looks like Comcell has been issuing copyright claims. By my count on April the 7th, there are five things that respond to my search, and one of them is currently under moderation due to a notice of claimed intellectual property infringement. It was two not too long ago, but I guess that other one disappeared. So, you know, we're not going to do that. We're not going to touch on other people's intellectual property too much. And instead, we're going to look at this. The Rururen which is a slight modification because that other curve was just a little tough to make. Fortunately, I know of another less copyrightable curve. Unfortunately, it means a lot more material. But, you know, that is fine because I'm sure you'll only have to make so many of these. So the shape we're looking at is the Rollo triangle and we don't even have to make an entire Rollo triangle. So we have all of these numbers, but really before you know how many numbers you need to generate, you're going to have to take a look at the actual curve. So for this, I'm going to jump over to Illustrator because I think it's just the easiest way to uh, figure out this sort of thing. We don't want to do too much heavy lifting, but we'll do a little bit. So this is just a new document and we're going to select the polygon tool and just click and make a triangle. Any triangle, that looks good. Then with the selection tool, we need to make the width of the triangle the height of the tube that we're trying to make. In my case, that is 115 millimeters. And making sure that the width and height proportions are constrained, you should end up with a scaled up equilateral triangle. At this point, you will use the ellipse tool to make a circle that is 230 millimeters from one side to the other. And then you can center that onto the top point of your triangle and if you did everything right then the bottom two points of the triangle should intersect with the circle then with the circle selected you can use the add anchor point tool to add anchor points where the uh, bottom part of that triangle intersects then you can use the direct selection tool to remove all of the things that you do not want and then you are left with the curve now, this curve is a little off, but we can shave that back, and the difference there is mostly negligible, though for now I'll just leave it how it was. Of course, we'll need to know how many layers of our material will fit in the height of this curve, and if we divide, well, really either of those numbers that we saw in the height by the thickness of my cardstock, 0.274 millimeters, we'll see that it's about 56. So this is the long and arduous part of the process. You'll need to make a 115 millimeter line and then make 55 additional copies. You want 56 lines. And you you are going to want to make sure you keep count because you don't want to go into these paths and have to figure out how many you've made. It would be a real hassle. So once you have your correct number of layers, you're going to line that first one that you had up at the very top. You're going to line that big group of other ones up with the point at the very bottom. Then you're going to select the top one as well and vertical distribute center. Ah, it just looks like a block. But if you zoom in, 
you can see all those lines. If you zoom in further, then you might be able to see breaks between them. And what would be really nice is if that one line on the top were a different color and locked. So that now, all you have to do is go through, line by line, with the Direct Select tool and move those anchors so that they intersect, and it should say intersect, with the line. And then once you've done that for both sides, for every single line, you can just select the line, and it will tell you the width at the top. So, the more lines you have, the longer and more arduous a process this is. But, you know, you just have to do it the once. So, maybe things could be easier, but maybe they could be a lot harder, too. Oh, and if things are like this, and you're having a hard time seeing the distinction between lines, you can always select a whole bunch of them and change the stroke to half a point or something like that. Then you'd be able to see all the lines. It'll make it a little easier, but yeah, 56 lines, that is 112 anchors to move, and in the end, you should end up with something that works. Anyway, that's enough staring at lines, let's go back to staring at numbers, numbers in lines. So, looking at this, you see we have three columns, layer length, total length, and width. The first four layers act as a plug so that we can keep our pennies just at the ends. Then layers 5 to 16 act as an additional sheath to hold those pennies in place. Then we've got layers 17 to 72, and these are our additional 56 layers. So the first layer length corresponds to the circumference of a penny, you know, plus a little bit, and each time we are adding the difference in circumference that is made up by there being an extra layer of cardstock. So looking at 2 pi r, we're just adding 2 pi, that paper thickness, to the length of each layer, and then getting the total length because that's important. And of course the width past layer 17 is what we figured out by moving those lines in in Illustrator. Now from this information we can go back into Illustrator and generate like a perfect curve or whatever. Or you could make a paper template and just get something pretty close. And either way, if you make something like this out of paper, you're going to want to seal it or harden it in some way. These are all just strips, again, of paper glued down. And not glued all the way down, just glued where they start and finish. So I coated this one with super glue, well, both of these, with super glue. I let that super glue set, and then I sanded it as smooth as I could. Now, I do think there's probably a better way to do that, uh, though it would be better in some respects and not as good in other respects. Granted, using super glue is not perfect, unless your idea of perfect is seeing visible fumes. So, you know, not perfect. And taking that into consideration, if you have a little extra money to spend, you might look into fiberglass resin. The same thing that you'd use to make a Pepecura suit of armor rigid. Of course, this thing is solid, so you don't need Rondo on the inside. So yeah, fiberglass resin, that'd probably work pretty well, and I know it would sand pretty well, so that would be, I don't know, maybe a little better than this, but it all depends on how well it will soak into the paper. It's really a toss-up. But uh, that's beside the point. As a proof of concept, I would say that this panned out. I was able to make both of these, and the curves are about what they should be, though. With these, one difficulty was getting the layers perfectly centered. But since everything wasn't glued in place, you know, not absolutely every part, it was easy enough to push in from both sides and get it to center before running a line of super glue and working my way around the rest of it. But yeah, that is that, of course. The plan is not to stop here. No, uh, what we're going to need is to do little cutouts and, you know, weird stuff. So I want to make these little plugs and they'll have solid cores and sort of look like RCA jacks on the top, like they have a little sheath around, but I want to just roll paper to make these and, you know, harden them with super glue or whatever. And then I can make little holes that these plug into and they should be able to hold up to what, uh, rotational stresses better than rolled paper drive shafts that I may have made in the past. This was always a point of contingency. I couldn't use a piece of wood because enough torsion on that, and it is going to twist. So I think keeping these short enough 
and having these additional points along multiple layers that, you know, whatever objects are attached to it can push, uh, should work out. So I've run some more numbers, and that's what I have here. This is not a perfect representation, but you can sort of see what it's like, and the horizontal lines are the lines where it loops over itself again. So I'm going to need some additional pieces to put this together, and it's going to take some testing. But maybe I'll put together a ready ward, and we can see about these little plugs, and maybe the thing that they plug into. Here's a hint. It's pinball. So... Yeah, that is what it is, and I just have to keep plunking along. Maybe that's a hint. So, until next time, this has been the Research Workshop on Rousseau Works, and I'm Rousseau, out. <laughs>